Hi, my name is Lorenzo Corneo, and I am a PhD student at Uppsala University in Sweden. In this video, I will be presenting Surrounded by the Clouds, which is our comprehensive cloud reachability study. I will be presenting on behalf of my co-authors that I warmly thank. I begin this presentation by providing a bit of background about cloud computing that will help to put into context our study. In the early 2000s, we have the dawn of cloud computing, a newly conceived programming paradigm that focuses its strength in seemingly unlimited computational and storage capabilities. Furthermore, the flexible pricing models, such as pay-as-you-go, made it very popular since businesses and individuals could use cutting-edge technologies without the need to purchase very expensive equipment. However, these computational facilities were physically located within data centers that were few and sparsely distributed around the world. Hence, they were unsuitable for time-sensitive applications. In fact, there were long communication latencies between them and the end users. As a result, in 2009, a new research movement, which is edge computing, challenged the cloud paradigm with argumentations against the high access latencies. After almost a decade of cloud computing, Liet Al presented the Cloud CMP at IMC 2010, which is what we believe the first significant cloud reachability study. In this study, the authors evaluated the cloud access latencies, among many things. Such latencies were too high to support the majority of time-sensitive applications that were envisioned by the edge computing pioneers. The cloud infrastructure has expanded constantly since the early 2000s. Cloud providers pioneers like Amazon, Google, Microsoft have expanded the reach of their data centers and have even deployed their own networking infrastructure with a goal to reduce their customers' access latency. Also, there are now many more providers such as DigitalOcean, Linode, Vulture. So, Cloud computing offerings are nowadays wider than ever, and the networking infrastructure keeps on being improved in order to cut latencies as down as possible. We therefore believe that it is time to re-evaluate the current state of cloud reachability at global scale, and this is our main contribution to the Web Conference 2021. In our study, we find answers to research questions like Can time-sensitive applications run on the current cloud infrastructure? How close are the clouds to the users? How pervasive are the cloud's networks? We answer these questions by evaluating both cloud access latency and path length between more than 8,000 globally distributed vantage points and almost 200 data centers. We conduct these measurements by using standard network diagnostic tools such as Bing and Traceroute. In this presentation, I will disclose up to which extent time-sensitive applications can be executed on a cloud environment. Moreover, I will discuss about our novel concept that we call cloud pervasiveness, as well as providing explanations regarding why we believe it is a relevant concept. I now discuss more in detail our approach. In this slide, I'll talk about the data centers that we used in our measurements. The table on the right side of the slide shows the breakout of the data centers per continent. We chose data centers from nine different cloud providers namely Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, Alibaba, DigitalOcean, Linode, and Vulture. In total, we included 189 data centers. The chosen providers are widely used, well-established, and provide global coverage with a distinct infrastructure. That is, their backbones could be either private, public, or private within certain states, which we indicate with semi in the table. Cloud performance is heavily influenced by the network between the users and the data centers. Some providers, like Linode, largely rely on the public internet for data center connectivity. On the other hand, providers such as Amazon have set up their private network backbones to connect older data centers. Additionally, several cloud providers sign agreements with major ISPs to ensure direct peering with their private point of presence. And as we can see from the map on the left side of the screen, the majority of data centers are located in the US, Europe and Asia. From this, we deduce that the current data center deployment covers more than 70% of the world's population. When it comes to selecting vantage points, we chose to use RIPE Atlas, since it is a de facto standard for internet measurements and has a very broad coverage. RIPE Atlas is a distributed measurements platform that counts more than 12,000 hardware probes. These probes are usually deployed in heterogeneous environments like homes and offices. Sometimes, even network operators use these probes to check their reachability from outside their network. We believe these probes are not really representative of user connectivity, and we therefore discard them. This way, 
we will have a possibly unbiased set of probes representing real users to cloud connectivity. We selected more than 8,000 probes that are installed in 184 countries around the world. To the best of our knowledge, there are no cloud reachability studies involving such a high number of vantage points. The density distribution of the selected vantage points can be seen in the world map on the right. The majority of them are deployed in Europe and roughly 1,000 in North America and Asia. The other continents account for an amount of probes between 2 and 300. Such a wide deployment allows us to confidently draw conclusion on global cloud reachability. I will now talk about the measurements and I will start by describing the latency measurements first. We run ICMP pings every three hours to all the probes nearby data centers within the same continent. This way, we were able to include in the study different days of the week and different times of the day. When the density of data centers within a continent is low, like for example South America in the figure, we also run ICMP pings towards neighboring continents' data centers, like North America. Our measurements were collected between September 2019 and September 2020. This ensures statistical relevance to our measurements. When it comes to measuring the path length between the probes and the data centers, we run both ICMP and TCP Paris trace route towards all the data centers available within the same continent. It is worth mentioning that we augmented our latency measurements with the round trip times returned by these trace routes. We opted to use also TCP trace route to ensure end to end reachability and also to estimate a plausible response time of a web server since these type of applications rely on TCP. Our experimentation resulted in the collection of more than 4 million unique paths, and we ran these measurements for a total of 5 repetitions between September and October 2020. Please notice that our dataset is publicly available at the link below, and it includes 60 gigabytes of measurements. We also released open source on GitHub the code for reproducing our results, so we warmly encourage the community to make use of our artifacts. I will now discuss about how we evaluated the feasibility of time-sensitive applications for the targeted data centers. Specifically, we used three well-known timing thresholds that I now describe. The first one, motion to photon, is the delay between the user input and its effect to be reflected on a display screen. An example of application that needs motion to photon delays is augmented reality. This is usually estimated to be below 20 milliseconds. The second one, human perceivable latency, is reached if the delay between the user input and the visual feedback becomes large enough to be detected by the human eye. An example of application requiring such timing threshold is cloud gaming, and this is usually estimated to be below 100 milliseconds. And finally, the human reaction time, it is the delay between the presentation of a stimulus and the associated motor response by a human. This is a typical situation that happens in remote control of vehicles. This threshold varies between individuals, but on average it is considered to be below 250 milliseconds. And the figure displayed on the right side of this slide is taken from our previous work, Pruning Edge Research with Latency Shares, which was presented at Hotnets 2020. In that work, we extensively discuss about latency requirements of time-sensitive applications. So for more details, please refer also to this paper. Before discussing the results of our analysis, I briefly explain how to read the following results. On an individual country basis, we report the percentage of the round-trip time samples that are below any of the aforementioned timing thresholds. Depending on the results, each country is assigned to one of four buckets representing a quartile each of the distribution. That is, one bucket accounts for 0-25% to of the samples, another one between 25 and 50, and so on until 100%. For visual feedback, please refer to the legend on the bottom left corner of the world map. And now that the latency evaluation criteria have been clarified, it is time to disclose the results of our measurements. From the point of view of the human reaction time, the situation at global scale looks very good. With 179 countries out of 184, that can consistently meet this timing threshold. Here, the interesting bit is that the human reaction time is consistently met also within those continents that have low density of data centers, like South America and Africa. When it comes to the human perceivable latency, the situation is not too different, since 140 countries out of 184 consistently meet the human perceivable latency threshold. But 
in opposition to the human reaction time, why can't some countries satisfy this threshold? The answer is to be found in the fact that these countries do not have an inland data center and they are not even sufficiently close to a neighboring country's data center. Here we have some examples in South America, Central Africa, and Middle East in Asia. But for the motion to photon threshold, the world picture is completely changed. In fact, we now have only 24 countries that can consistently meet this threshold. These are to be found in Central and Northern Europe and some Asian countries like Japan. We believe this is due to the high density of deployed inland data centers, the limited size of the countries, and the good networking infrastructure. On the other hand, big countries with inland data centers can still meet this threshold between 50 and 75% of the times, which is still remarkable. Some examples are the US, Brazil, and Australia. This confirms the fact that distance is still one of the biggest latency contributors and can be limited only with more data centers deployment. And in the next slide, I will introduce cloud pervasiveness. Our novel concept, called cloud pervasiveness, tries to quantify how close the cloud networks are. We defined cloud pervasiveness as the ratio between the amount of routers owned by a cloud provider along a path and the total path length. The plot on the right side helps in understanding this concept. Here we have the four green nodes that belong to a cloud provider, the two gray nodes belong to an ISP, and the pink node is the end user. Therefore, the cloud pervasiveness would be 4 sevenths. We believe that this concept is important as it provides insights about how much the cloud can still expand. For example, high cloud pervasiveness translates in the cloud networks being very close to the end users, hence limiting the space for cloud expansion. Additionally, cloud pervasiveness gives an understanding on how much potential is still available for entering the already competitive and crowded cloud and network operators market. And this is an outlook of cloud pervasiveness exhibited by the cloud providers part of our study. It is very easy to see that some of the providers already own almost half of the path between the probes and the data centers. These providers, unsurprisingly, are the ones that have deployed their own networking infrastructure. They can be found among Amazon, Google, IBM, and Microsoft. The remaining cloud providers mainly rely on the public internet to route network traffic towards their data centers, and therefore show much lower cloud pervasiveness, see DigitalOcean, Linode, and Vulture. It is worth mentioning that similar behavior is also witnessed by a recent study from IMC 2020 by Arnold et al. The authors report that major cloud providers often bypass tier 1 network operators, and this allows end users to bypass the public internet completely while transiting through private cloud networks. But one might now be wondering, what are the main differences between providers that have own infrastructure and the ones relying on the public internet? From the point of view of the latency, we did not find any significant difference. In fact, the latency distributions are very similar with a slightly higher latency variation exhibited by providers routing traffic through the public internet. So we can conclude that higher cloud pervasiveness does not translate to lower latency. It is now time to wrap up my talk and I want to conclude this presentation by delivering what we believe is a very important message. Cloud data centers are close to the users. Data centers being distant and have high access latency is just a long gone myth and it is not anymore actual. We are in fact surrounded by the clouds. As I earlier discussed, cloud providers put a lot of resources and effort to expand their infrastructure and provide global coverage. As we can see also in this map, the current cloud infrastructure already serves very well more than 70% of the world's population. In fact, the current cloud infrastructure is able to deliver consistently almost anywhere in the world the human perceivable latency and, up to a point, the motion to photon. This means that many time sensitive applications can already safely run in the cloud. But what is preventing users to reach the human perceivable latency everywhere in the world? Well, this is to be found in the low density of data centers deployments in Africa, South America, and some regions in Asia. We believe it is there that cloud providers should put their effort in expanding their infrastructure with additional data centers. I conclude by mentioning that our research paper offers many more interesting results for you to discover.
Thanks for watching.